Again, uh, welcome to today's webinar with TechSoup for Libraries, Digital Media Labs and Makerspaces in Small and Rural Libraries. We have a few fabulous guests today. Um, first of all, I'm the facilitator of the webinar. My name is Crystal Schimpf. I uh, work in, in the library arena and also in the nonprofit arena. You'll find me at Community Technology Network, a nonprofit here in San Francisco, and also working with uh, special projects for the Public Library Association when you don't find me here working for TechSoup. Uh, we also have Mary Glendening who is the Director of the Middletown Free Library in Pennsylvania. Her library experience extends back to when she was a young adult, and uh, she has brought that uh, into her own library to foster creativity with the MFL Create Space, which she'll tell us about later. Uh, Tim Miller is the branch manager of the Simla Library, which is of the Elbert County Library District in Colorado. Uh, Tim has helped establish a new media lab in this small town with a population of about 1,000. Um, assisting with chat, we have Ginny Mees, and tweeting again is Arielle Gilbert Knight. Uh, so you'll see their names popping up throughout the presentation. Also assisting with uh, chat is Becky Wiegand. Now our agenda for today is to uh, go over uh, some various aspects of makerspaces and media labs in, in uh, small and rural libraries. But we'll start off with a little introduction to TechSoup. And at the end we'll have an uh, opportunity for you to have your questions answered. So again, please put your uh, questions in the chat throughout the webinar today. Um, also, you know, we do have a focus on small and rural libraries today. Um, but I know we have people from all varieties of libraries, and perhaps even some nonprofits in the room. I know we have some systems joining us, some large regional systems, and also some larger libraries as well. So hopefully uh, you walk away with a few ideas that you can take with you to your library or to your region uh, with regards to this topic. Now if you are new to, to TechSoup, um, you may want to know a little bit about our organization. We are a 501 nonprofit with a clear focus on connecting nonprofits, charities, libraries, and foundations with tech products and services, uh, including learning resources to help make more informed decisions about your technology. We have been around since 1987 and have helped over 200,000 charitable organizations in over 60 countries around the world. Uh, today this is a United States focused webinar, but we also have the TechSoup Global uh, offices throughout the world. And I think there might even be a few people joining us from uh, other countries today. So welcome. TechSoup offers many things including consulting services and product donations like Windows 8.1 and QuickBooks 2014. And uh, of course those product donations are available on the website. Uh, for. Uh, you can register to receive them and uh, see what your eligibility is. This is just an example of one of the product pages on the TechSoup website. So if you are interested in that, please go to TechSoup.org. So with that, I think we are ready to get into our topic at hand. And uh, let's just start off by taking a, a look at the overview of Makerspaces and Media Labs, uh, just so we can be sure we are all on the same page talking about the same types of services. Now, uh, makerspaces and media labs, th these are terms uh, that we, we maybe have some broad definitions. Um, and uh, they, they also have a lot of overlapping. But generally, when we are talking about makerspaces, we might be talking about the things you see here, 3D printing, coding, uh, inventions, creativity, uh, um, other tools that relate to the making and creation of things. Uh, in media labs, we are talking perhaps about audio and video recording, uh, digital cameras or digital video, and different types of production. Uh, but really, um, that doesn't mean that a makerspace can't include the, the parts of a media lab or vice versa. Um, uh, makerspaces and media labs are really community workshops where people in our library community can come together to create things. Um, they can be customized to your library, uh, your size, your location, and your community needs. And I think it's really important to emphasize that there's no right or wrong way to do a makerspace or media lab. The right way is to do it so that it serves your community's needs. So let's just take a quick poll, and uh, you, know, you should see this appearing on your screen. Do you offer programming related to makerspaces or media labs at your library? Um, so uh, you know, yes, no, or perhaps you are you're unsure, and that's okay. So I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. And I see lots of responses are coming in. And I think it's important to notice here that you may have programming related to makerspaces or media labs, but uh, may not have a regular uh, physical space. And, and that's okay. That would still count towards that yes response. 
So I'm going to give you just a few more seconds to respond. It looks like we've had most people participate, so I'm going to give a little countdown here. Five, four, three, two, and one. And we will close the poll. And now we should be able to see, should see those results in front of you. So about 60% of you uh, aren't currently offering programming. So I hope that for, for those of you who are uh, new to this avenue of Makerspaces and Media Labs, this webinar will give you some ideas and inspiration for how to approach it at your library, no matter how big or small it is. Also, I see that some of you have uh, been offering programming, and I hope for those of you uh, that uh, you, you maybe walk away with a few new tips to augment what you are already providing. And if you are not sure, then hopefully by the end of this webinar you get a nice definition of what Makerspaces and Media Labs are or could be, and bring that back to your library as well. Now another important thing to consider is the why. Uh, why should we have a Makerspace or Media Lab in our library? Um, you see some reasons here on the screen. Of course, the tech skills, that's a big uh, conversation that's going on in libraries now, whether it's for uh, teens or for youth or for adults. Um, you know, we've got the STEM things happening in schools, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. And we also have uh, things for adults needing more technology skills. But also there's small business development and uh, creative thinking skills that come from this, youth engagement, opportunities for collaboration. And some of you may have ideas of, of what value uh, a Makerspace or Media Lab might bring to your community. So here we'll have a nice uh, open-ended poll where you can actually type in um, some responses. So if, if you have an idea of how this might bring value to your community, please type this in. Um, and, and I will see those responses, and, and I might share some of them back with the group as, as we're talking. I know um, each community is a little bit different. Um, so I'm sure some of you may be typing right now. You can also, um, I'll just remind you at the same time if you do have any questions to go ahead and put those into the uh, chat. So I see you know, keeping libraries relevant is something that's popping up here. Um, because of course uh, as technology changes and people's needs change, libraries uh, maybe should change along with that to main maintain relevancy in our community. Um, also lots of things about um, access to new and evolving technology, especially if you're in a rural area. People may not have access. They can't walk into the local Apple store or Best Buy in, in order to try new technology. Um, sharing resources and community collections of knowledge and cr uh, creation and information. These are all very wonderful ideas. I see somebody posted a creating video family histories. And of course genealogy and family research is a, a very big uh, thing as well. And so many responses are coming in. I'm afraid I can't read them all. Um, but just to say I can tell that you all have a very good idea of how you might be able to apply this in your library or what the need might be. And, and that, that demand, that, that need, that benefit to your community is something that's very important to remember when you're seeking funding or support for a media lab. And so with that, um, I'm going to close the poll in just a few minutes, and we're going to move on to talking about, or in just a few seconds I should say, um, and uh, capture all of the responses that, that you've had. Um, it's, a, it's a very wonderful collection that, um, that you've shared with us, so thank you. So I'm going to close that, and we're going to move on actually to the uh, next slide which t talks about how do we uh, uh, create a media lab. Because of course there is technology involved, and technology is not always free, although sometimes it could be. So remember that you might be able to apply for grants. Um, that might be uh, like an LSTA or grant or another local grant uh, that might help uh, advance your technology. Also there might be donations, whether it's in the form of money or in the form of technology. If somebody in your community is getting rid of an old digital camera, do they know that you might be able to benefit from that? Um, there might be community partnerships where uh, someone in your community provides space or equipment for you to, to offer programming. It's also good to remember that you don't have to do everything at once. You could start small with one device or one piece of software and uh, that there might also be free resources available. And we'll share some free resources throughout this webinar that can help you with uh, media, media Lab and Makerspace programming. Um, I'll just r remind you that you'll receive a, uh, an email with all of those resources, uh, with the links to those resources at the end of this webinar um, in the next day or so. So with that, I think we're ready to hand things over to Mary who is going to tell us about the Create Space at the Middletown Free Library. Mary? 
Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a good day. Um, so on this first screen you see two logos. We, already, we had a library logo, but for our CreateSpace project I kind of want to develop a sort of different identity. So I went to uh, this website called 48 Hours Logo. And in 48 hours you have all these people bid on your logo and, and design it. So um, they did a really great job and we're really happy with how that came out. And we thought it kind of drew in everything we were going for with the space, which I will start talking about now. Okay, um, let me just tell you a little bit about our library. Um, we're located in the Philadelphia suburbs. The population of our township is um, 15,000 people. And um, we're pretty busy. Our CERC is good, but it's been kind of going down a little bit. But we are really heavy on, on programming. So um, I think while CERC is kind of leveled out, programs continue to grow. and um, you know, be something that, that people really, really are looking for in our community. Um, we have three full-time staff and seven part-time people. And our library is um, actually too small for, <laughs> for us, and we're hoping sometime in the future to get a new space. But um, right now we have 6,000 square feet, and we only have one program room. So this is kind of what I was working with to start out. And you can see these pictures. Um, the top picture is the storage space I have to store all our equipment in for the grant. And then the bottom is just two views of the, the program room. So this, in this program room, all of our library programs take place from story hours to book groups to historical lectures and, and things like that. So um, it was a, a bit of a, a challenge when we kind of decided to take on this, this project. Where were we going to store everything? And how is it going to work just having the one room available? And in this picture up at the top where you see the stuff that's stored in there right now, it's, it's a little bit of a mess because I'm still getting things kind of organized and waiting for um, some furniture and stuff to come. But um, that room was filled with furniture and things from the Family Place program. So we had to like figure out what we were going to do with all of that stuff we had in there too because we needed to clear out at least half of the room to, to store the materials. So um, how did we decide to, to do this project? Um, I, you know, like everybody else I guess, you know, you're looking at Facebook and see things come up from the various uh, libraries and things that you follow. And I kept seeing things about makerspaces. Um, but a lot of what I saw was libraries that had obviously must have had big budgets because they had like a trailer or a space just dedicated to um, their project. So our problem was, you know, we have this non, we have to have a non-permanent setup, and how are we going to deal with that? And um, you know, I just the project idea kind of grew out of a Facebook post I made where I shared some story I saw, and I said, wow, this would be really fun to do at our library, and um, one of our, our youth services coordinators saw it and she's like, well, you know, LSTA is offering these grants um, for creation programs. Why don't you apply for it? So I, I talked to um, my board president at the time, and he was um, all about it. He runs a small business where they use Arduinos and microcontrollers, and he had a, a friend, um, we had a mutual friend that he had sent to Maker, Maker Fair in New York and had gotten a 3D printer and, and stuff. So he's like, yes, we definitely have to do this project. This will be great. So, um, and I had only been at the library for like a month in my position now. So I kind of really came into this and hit, hit the ground running, I guess you could say. Um, so in the planning process and dealing with this idea that we only have this one program room and we have to share the space, um, I started to do some some more research on the web to see what other libraries were doing and um, what kind of ideas I could come up with to see what other libraries have in their spaces and um, what other places were, were doing. Um, and I came across the UMedia project out of Chicago where they were doing a lot of work with digital media and teenagers. And um, I started seeing other libraries had digital media labs. And I thought this was a great way to um, be able to have a non-permanent kind of space in our, our library. So we kind of moved away from looking at just a maker space because you know, I can't have, really have woodworking machines and, and stuff and on our carpet and then have story hour come in afterwards. <laughs> so um, I started moving away from just being a maker space, which seemed like maybe a limited audience, and kind of thought about bringing in this digital media aspect. And um, 
my husband actually is an audio engineer and is a signed recording artist. So I like knew I had this expert at my disposal who, who could help me with at least the audio end of things. So um, the project kind of grew and, and came together as I was working on the LSTA grant um, for, for funding. And um, in my research too, I came across Tony Wagner. I don't know if you all are familiar with him, but he wrote a book called Calling All Innovators. And it talks about um, the kinds of skills that our kids need to develop to be successful in the future, the kinds of skills that companies like Google or Microsoft or Apple are looking for in their employees. And it's not just necessarily those tech skills, but it's the kind of skills, um, you know, being able to think outside the box to not be afraid of trial and error and collaboration, and also the idea that, that children will develop their passions and, and the things that they're interested in through the opportunity, you know, through exposure and working on those things. And I thought, you know, that's a great fit for the library because a lot of kids don't get that in school anymore. They're so focused on testing and that kind of thing that the library really has this opportunity to be a place where kids can come in, we're not grading them, we're not, you know, they don't have to worry about finishing their project per se. Um, the idea is just to work together to come up with something and do it. And does it fail? Okay, well let's just go back to the drawing board and, and, and start over or, or see how we can improve it and, and really build those kind of skills. I, I think libraries have spent a lot of time working with preschool age kids and getting them ready for school. Well, why does it stop? once they enter school, we, have, we still have a role to play. And I think nowadays with the testing and um, Common Core and that kind of thing, you know, we become even more important and be able to offer that kind of environment. So in the meantime, I applied for this grant. And because it's federal money, there was lots of delays in, in the notification process. So I just kind of kept my, you know, just kept researching stuff to see, you know, where else could I get money if this doesn't come through and that kind of thing. And I found out about Maker Camp and I had signed up um, to be an affiliate site um, at, at some point on their website. I don't even remember. But in June of last year, I get this email from them that we were selected as a site and, and did we want to do it. And it was a, <laughs> this is a real launch of our project, but it was kind of made me hesitate a moment because Maker, you know, I got this email mid June, and Maker Camp starts the first week in July, and I was like, oh my gosh, do we have time to get this together? How are we going to do it? So um, we went ahead and did that, and around the same time, we actually found out we received um, the LSTA grant. So it was really like a great coming together of um, getting the programming off the ground and moving forward, and finding out we had money to actually launch an even bigger project than than we had thought. So part of what we did in, um, after we, we ran the summer maker camp and um, we had, we had you know, decent attendance and we had some kids that really, like you'll probably see them in my slides because they're in a lot of the slides, but we had a real core, core audience for that. And, um, and then once the summer ended, while we were putting the grant advisory board together and deciding what we were going to purchase, we kept doing um, programming. To, to keep and generate the interest in, in the kind of programming we were going to be able to launch. So we um, did some Instructables build nights um, where you can sign up through the Instructables website and they'll send you materials. So in September we did uh, Lumi Inko Dye where the kids got to go on the computer and find pictures and turn them into negatives and print them out. And then you do this, um, it's like, I don't know if you remember like back in the day they had where you put stuff on this blue paper and you put it out in the sun it developed. Well, the dye develops like that on a, on a t-shirt. And we did other kinds of programming like that. Um, I did a survey of the community to find out what kind of programming and materials they were interested in, which um, gave me some insight into some things I hadn't even thought about. Um, and then who, you know, who is going to teach the programs? Who is going to lead the programs or teach workshops? Um, you know, what what's going to be in our space, and then the other things you know, we had to think about and are still thinking about are sustainability and how do we keep programming going, fun programming, uh, once the grant runs out. And um, in this little picture here you can see some um, little bits kits. And those are circuits that work with magnets, and you can use them to make projects. It's a good way to teach um, how circuits work and things to kids without having to use soldering irons. 
Um, and there's also, there's, you see that one in the middle says Unleash Your Inner Rockstar. They just came out with a, um, co a collaboration with Korg. Um, so you can build a synthesizer and do experiments with sound. Um, so, there's, so those are just some of the things that we have in our space. Okay, um, so like I said, our space is kind of two different angles. We have this digital media aspect and the maker space aspect, but they really can work together um, you know, because making is really all about creativity, and there's many different ways to express that creativity. Um, so we have two Mac Minis. Um, one is a digital audio workstation for audio projects, and then the other um, is dedicated to video and digital drawing projects. Um, I'm a Windows gal, so I had to have a Windows machine, so I didn't feel completely lost. And I wanted to have. I didn't want to just be all Macs or all Windows because um, I. You know, people feel comfortable working in different environments. So um, we got a Lenovo ThinkStation C30, which is a really high-end Windows machine. Um, and it, you, know, you can put tons of RAM in it. There's lots of expansion space. So I figured at least I have this one machine too that can really grow with the space and we can do, add things to it if we want to um, you know, expand the computer and do things like that. Um, a photo scanner, which we hadn't had before, and then we got a large format photo printer, which you can use to print up poster size um, projects and, and things like that. Um, we got digital drawing tablets. Um, we ha already had an HD video camera, so we I decided to go with um, action cameras. And I, after some research, I decided on the Ghost. We have got a Ghost HD and a Ghost HDS, which is their newest model. Um, and they're similar to the GoPro, except they have a built-in LED screen, and they're a little bit easier to use, especially with kids. And we're thinking, we're working on an angle to let people check stuff out of the space. So these were a good way to go with that, because they're, you know, you can drop it on the ground and it's not going to break and that kind of thing. So you don't have the same concerns as you would with a regular video camera. Um, we got a green screen kit and these little tabletop movie making kits that have like lights, and you build it all together, and you can do stop motion. Um, with the iPads. And then on the Makerspace side, um, you know, everybody's all about 3D printing, so um, that was a big part of our project. And our board, I think the board was most excited about that because that's something they've heard about in, in the news. Um, so we got a replicator too from MakerBot, and then the 2X, which is the one that can print out in two colors. Um, it's a more exper experimental machine, but we decided um, since we're only going to have this, this much money once, we got, we got that one. So um, as people that use our space, as their skills grow, they have something to grow into. Um, we got two Silhouette Craft Cutters, which you can use for all kinds of different projects. Um, everything you can make magnets and temporary tattoos and do t-shirts and um, vinyl, cut out vinyl things, and uh, it's, it has so many uses. It's a it's really cool machine. And um, since most of our purchasing was happening in December, we got to take advantage of some really great holiday deals that places were running. So um, that really worked to our benefit. Uh, one of the things that came out of our survey was people were interested in sewing and having access to sewing machines. So that was something we added um, to the space that we hadn't thought about um, before. The Little Bits kits. Um, then Raspberry Pi, which is a small, they're like $37 computer. It runs Linux, and there's, you can use it for projects, for teaching coding. Um, we're going to use it with our Minecraft club uh, to do some things with Minecraft. Um, then we are going to be pr doing an Arduino day this month or in March, and um, so we're going to be purchasing Arduinos, which are microcontrollers, which you can use to control LEDs and do robotics and things like that. Um, and then we got these kits. Um, it's really tiny, and it's next to that little bit box. But um, we got these Minecraft circuits in real life kits that we're going to use with our, our Minecraft club. And it's um, the kids will learn how to do some basic soldering. And based off a of redstone in the Minecraft game, um, it kind of brings that out of the game into real life, so they can learn about how circuits really work. So um, the next part of our project is, well, we have all this stuff. Now what do we do with it? Um, so the, we th are think, you know, still planning programs, workshops, and different, different clubs. Our, most of our clubs have, have already launched. Um, 
Minecraft and Real Life Club has been by far our most popular club, and I have a waiting list of people to, to get into the, to that club. And we're really exploring all different things with that, from more maker-type projects to um, digital media projects. Um, last meeting they worked on storytelling. Uh, they, came, they worked in groups and were coming up with a story of what they would build in Minecraft and what's the story ar around their, their build that they're going to do. And then the next meeting they're going to build it. They're going to work together to build it in, uh, using Minecraft EDU. And then they're going to film each other um, talking about their stories and do some storytelling with that and maybe um, also move into some stop motion animation um, with their stories. Uh, we're going to use the circuit kits. We've done, I've used it to do 3D printing um, with the kids. And I have a whole list of, I think, at least a year's worth, <laughs> worth of programs just revolving around Minecraft and the various things that we have in our space. Um, we're also going to have some audio programs and workshops for kids and adults. Um, we just started a series using the Little Bit Synth Kits with um, kids. It was like kids aging from age 6 to about 8 years old. Um, learning about you know, how synthesis works, how does a synthesizer work, what's an envelope, um, you know, and, and the kinds of stuff that they don't normally get to explore. And then we're going to um, come back and they're going to build more complex synthesizers and that kind of thing. Um, we're going to do a teen uh, tech week workshop with audio on both. Um, and that will be kind of directed by the teens and what they want want to learn about and work on some projects, whether it's podcasting, um, learning how to use uh, audio programs like Ableton or even GarageBand, um, and using the Little Bits kits. We have some video workshops coming up. Using Our first one is going to be on um, iPads and iMovie. Um, we have, we're going to be doing some things with the digital drawing tools as well. We have a comic book artist who's going to come in and, and teach about doing digital drawing. Uh, 3D printing workshops. I'm, right now I'm trying to tr get all my staff trained on the 3D printer so we can have it available um, outside of, of the lab since it can't be set up all the time. I need to be able to make sure. I don't want it just sitting in a room and only being dragged out like a few times a year when we're going to do a, a program around it. Um, we did Hour of Code in December, and I signed us up to be a Coder Dojo. And um, that's probably something we'll launch more in the summertime when I have more time and to give me some more time to to some, find some volunteers to help with that. Um, our, since our space is portable um, or easy to pack up, we've designed a lot of it to be portable so we can take it out into the community as well. Um, we'll be taking our 3D printer to Healthy Kids Day at the Y. Um, our friends group has a really big book sale at our local mall, and we brought it there to generate interest in the, the space and our projects. Um, and we'll be working with the local schools and um, Homeschool groups are really big, and they're really interested in these and um, and the projects that we're doing at the library. Um, and then we'll have some open lab times where people will we'll have the lab open, and they'll let me know what they want to use. Um, and I'm also working on ways to make it some of the tools available at times when it's not open lab, um, since everything's on wheels, and I can wheel it out to a place in the library if they want to use. Um, the video editing tools, you know, we can wheel the, the computer to where they want to work, and with headphones and stuff it shouldn't be an issue with noise. Um, we're starting a Young Makers Club, which is for kids between ages 8 and 18 years old. And that's, um, that's going to be a lot of fun. We're starting that next month. It will be our first meeting. Um, and that's really where the kids kind of get the chance to design their own projects and come up with what they want to work on and what they want to learn about. and the, and the the goal at the end will be that they will dis display their project, what they have done. Even if it's not complete, they'll display what they're working on in a, um, a mini maker fair, which we'll probably have at the library. Um, we signed up with Curiosity Hacked to be an official site. They used to be called the Hacker Scouts, and they just recently changed their name. Um, and we're doing their Open Lab program, which is a family program. Um, so the, parent, the, so the family works together on the project. It's a closed-ended project that just takes place at the meeting. Um, so you don't have to worry about people coming back each month and that kind of thing. And we can open it up to younger kids um, since their parents take, play, take part in the program with them. Um, we did First Lego League and Junior First Lego League this summer. Um, we started that. Um, 
that's the real, it's kind of a growing program where working out the kinks because it didn't go as smooth as we would have hoped. But um, I think it's a really great program, and it really, um, the kids get to work with robotics. Uh, the younger kids work with simple machines, and you can add a robotics element. So um, that might be something we add for them in the, in the future. And I mentioned Maker Camp before, and that's a really great um, program. It's run by Make Magazine on Google+. And um, you can basically run it however you want. Um, we did met twice a week at 2 o'clock when they do the live Hangouts, and then we would watch some of the Hangout, and then um, the kids would work on a, a project, whether it was a project that was supplied, with, that was um, stuff that was in the supplies that makes sense to me, or stuff that I found that we could do easily, because um, I didn't have all the skills or things to be able to do everything that was in the box. So. Um, and any library can – I know MAKE is looking to sign up more libraries this year, and if you go to makercamp.com, uh, you can sign up to be an affiliate site. And it's a lot of fun, and it's a really, really easy way to get started with this kind of programming. And then I just have some pictures. Yes? Yeah, I just this is Crystal, and I just wanted to jump in. Um, okay. In the interest of time, I know you have some wonderful pictures to share, and I, okay. I, I definitely want to share those, but we're getting – uh, also some great questions. So I want to make sure to have time at the end for the questions and answers. Sure. So if you could wrap your pictures up with a, yep. um, with a nice story, and then um, uh, that way we'll have time for some of these great questions that are coming in. And as I say that, I want everyone to know that uh, with all of these questions, if we don't get to all of them today, we will follow up later to get you the answers to those questions. So, um, so keep sending us those questions in. So Mary, um, please tell us about these beautiful pictures. Oh, sure. <laughs> so the um, picture in the bottom left corner, those kids um, outside with the solar oven, those were kind of my core Maker Camp kids over the summer. And um, they just had a, had a really wonderful time and have come to other programs we've had since then as well. Actually, my son is that guy on the right with his hands up, and he's in a few of these pictures. Um, so, and some of the things we did up in the right, top right corner is a, a Makey Makey kit where you can hook up bananas and stuff, and the kids had fun with that, um, the Lumi Inco die. And the bottom right corner is actually not in our space. It was at Maker Fair in New York, but um, he's using a, a, a program there um, called Project Spark that Microsoft is working on that I, I hope to use in our space as well. Um, and then this next slide is um, the couple of pictures on the bottom left are, are from Maker Camp over the summer when we were doing scratch programming and Makey Makey. And then these other program these other pictures are from the Little Bit Synth Kit program we did recently. And um, so the guy in the black and gray sweater, he was the instructor. That's that's my husband Isaac actually and he like I said he's a he's an audio engineer. Um, so he was teaching the kids about how about sound and how that works and that kind of thing, and they had a blast. And uh, the end is um, some more Maker Camp. They made light up hoodies. Um, the one on the right hand corner, that's our 3D printer, and that's from our Minecraft club um, when we did 3D printing. And then on the bottom, um, on the table, there's a little cardboard creation that was from one of our projects, and um, they're learning some DJing tools down there as well. And Thank you so much for having me. Great. Yeah, thank you for sharing. You have so much information and, and so much experience from what you've done. And I can tell from the amount of questions we're getting that people are very curious to learn more. And so what we'll do is, is uh, since I don't think we'll get to all the questions, we'll collect these questions and we'll gather those answers and share them back out with all of the participants uh, here, um, those of you joining us and those who registered but weren't able to join us. Um, but one question before we move on to Tim's, uh, section is is uh, could you tell us just very briefly what is a green screen kit? Someone had asked uh, oh, what that means. So a green screen kit is like it's basically just um, like a green cloth, and it, our kit came with uh, lighting, so we can can do lighting. But you film in front of the green screen, and um, then you can put in backgrounds like like we're going to use it for we do a um, a story like a video story hour on Vimeo. And um, so we're gonna like Jason's gonna read stories, and we're gonna we can like have him reading Madeline from um, Paris because you can put him like sitting in the street in Paris or something. And so it's it's like as if you ever see movies where there's special effects and they show them filming it and they are in that green, and they're they're just filming the backgrounds green. That's basically what a green screen kit is, and it lets you um, be able to film something and then put in your own kind of backgrounds and stuff, so it looks like you're somewhere you're not. 
Great. Yeah, and I think that's exactly the answer that we were looking for to ex help explain some of this technology. And, and we are collecting all the links for the different resources that Mary and Tim are both mentioning, and we'll be sending that out in the archive. Um, so you'll, you'll have all of those links, those of you that are asking for specific things. Um, we're making note if it was something we didn't already have a link of, and we'll be sharing that out later. And so now I'd like to um, turn things over to Tim who's going to tell us about his experience with the Simla Branch Library in uh, developing a digital media lab there. Tim? Thanks, Crystal. Hello? Hello? Yep. Yep, okay. we can hear you. Go, <laughs> go right ahead. Sorry about, sorry about <laughs> no, that. No, that's okay. Um, First of all, I want to say I'm very jealous of, of Mary and, and everything she has going on at her library. Um, uh, for some of you who, who might be listening uh, who have a smaller library, I just wanted to say that it's very possible for you to, to get a media lab or um, creation station uh, going for your library. I kind of use the term synonymously, so I'm going to jump back and forth uh, between them. Um, this is my library. Uh, obviously it wasn't designed by a professional architect, but we're very thankful for uh, what we have here. Um, it's 2,000 uh, square feet, and it's, it's a one-room library. So, uh, oops. So, um, our users are, are forced to, to kind of coexist in, in one space. Um, these two pictures on this slide um, are from one corner to the other. Uh, and, and our media lab space, therefore, must be mobile. Um, we have to be able to, to move it uh, to different spaces. Um, Moving forward, um, that's, that's uh, the town we serve. Uh, our population is 650, service population of about 1,000 to 2,000. Um, technology access is limited. Uh, I noticed one of you had asked a question about wireless and, and broadband and, and what that was looking at for us. Well, we have one Internet service provider for the area. Um, the way it's set up, no other providers may move in. Um, and technology can be patchy for people in town, but also uh, in the area we serve, which is uh, pretty much um, hundreds of square miles around us. Uh, the closest library is the, the Lyman Library, 26 miles away. So we, we are a vital uh, resource for, uh, for Wi-Fi and, and broadband and just access, accessing the, uh, the greater world through those. This is what I consider to be the beginning of our media lab. Um, we were part of the BTOP grant uh, in Colorado, which is uh, beyond technology opportunity. Uh, anyway, I'm sure Crystal can tell you what that is. But uh, we got some laptops. We got some uh, iPads for that. Uh, and the reason I consider it to be part or the beginning of our media lab is, uh, is because we set them out for use after they had been locked away. When we got them, we were very scared of, of setting them out for, for people to use. Um, when I showed up, which was roughly a couple of years ago, um, I found the, the iPads locked in a cabinet. Um, my staff and I brought them out. Um, and my director came by and said, hey, why not do that with the laptops as well? Uh, we brought those out for general use. I think the intended use was different, um, but we wanted to make them accessible for, for people to simply play. Um, and that, that component is really important in a media lab. Um, you could have a ton of, of formalized programs and everything else, but if you can set things out for people to just play and have fun, I, I, I think you'll be amazed at, at the kind of things that, that come up and, and the kind of learning that occurs in your library. Moving forward, um, 
This uh, we, we achieved through a grant, uh, the creation station, um, which was actually the end of the B top grant cycle with leftover funds. I think the, library who, the libraries who got these funds got about $2,000 a piece. The equipment you're looking at here was, a, was around $2,000. If any of you are wondering how much it costs, uh, we got a MacBook. Um, we got, if you're wondering what the funky uh, War of the Worlds looking tripod thing is over in the corner, that's an iPad. Um, but uh, you can snap on a, a boom mic as well as a high definition lens for that. Uh, some other things we got were recording equipment, uh, microphone in particular. And in the middle, um, the little rectangular vice, device was a, an M audio device, which allows your, your guitar or your microphone to directly plug in. Um, to say the, the MacBook there, and then you can record on GarageBand or, or any of your other um, computers. Uh, what we found when we uh, first started using uh, the creation station was that it wasn't getting a lot of individual use, um, meaning that People were kind of intimidated by using the equipment. They didn't know what it was for. Um, I did market it by uh, going and uh, showing or doing several presentations at the school to show the equipment. So uh, we decided to pursue a different strategy for um, trying to get that equipment used and, and make our community comfortable with it. Uh, what we did was we infiltrated community in organizations. Um, for instance, uh, we have a nonprofit organization um, of which uh, I became a president. Um, and it became apparent that um, through that I could uh, we could make training videos. Um, in other words, I went into the organization, figured out a use, and, and sold the, the Media Lab uh, to, to the community organizations. And it turns out um, groups started using it. Uh, we had people do uh, weather videos, uh, well, weather workshop videos with our equipment. Um, and here are some pictures of, of other community uses that cur occurred as a result to that. Um, there are stories behind every single picture uh, you see here. One of the most endearing uh, stories is, is in the upper left picture. Um, that is, uh, the kid's name is Johnny. He's, he's uh, one of our common patrons. He loves the iPad. He's always coming in um, asking me to download apps. He brings his friends in an every, every uh, quite often. And uh, one day he came in during our Tea on Tuesdays crafting group, which uh, as you may be aware is a really low-tech maker activity uh, that some of your, your rural libraries are, are probably already doing. Um, well, Johnny came in and as usually asked for an iPad. Well, um, he happened to uh, take interest in, in this other maker, this low-tech maker activity. Um, and uh, through it, a, a remarkable Photo, photo op ensued, uh, and, and we snapped a bunch of pictures and everything else. So uh, the reason I point that out as is, is a particular story is, is because these, uh, I, I think Mary alluded to it too, these, these low-tech maker activities as well as just library use can be enhanced uh, through a, a very simple digital media lab, whether that involves just iPads, just a couple laptops uh, with software. Um, the potential is endless. If any of you have any questions about the, the uh, pictures on the previous slide, I'm, I'm happy to elaborate too. One of the primary uh, uses uh, for our creation station has been through the Historical Society. And uh, this had also been mentioned, I believe, as a question before. Um, oral histories. Uh, we use the equipment to record a lot of oral histories. When I first came to town here, I discovered that no one um, was recording and digitizing these materials. And, and our town in particular, and I'm sure most towns have such a rich history, we did not want that to be lost. And I say we because it's the Historical Society and I. Um, the photos are here because we, we use scanners as, as part of our 
media lab to, to scan those in and uh, to enhance them through a, an open source software called GIMP. Uh, but the oral histories are great. Um, I'd be happy to share, share those with some of you as well. Um, Moving forward, um, other things people have used the, uh, the Media Lab to do are uh, design menus for local restaurants. Now, uh, I talked about the technology access before. Um, one of our, our local restaurants, the Hen House, has, has typically come in and not only designed uh, menus, but designed other uh, media. Um, well, I mentioned uh, um, the weather people making training videos. Um, a lot of, of younger kids have really taken to the iPads. Uh, and, and yes, they play a lot of games. But the secret is they're learning at the same time, uh, learning with games like the sand, Sandbox, Minecraft, uh, Roblox. And I can elaborate a little bit on, on how those uh, help people learn. Um, We've also uh, Skyped in off authors with our book clubs. Um, and most importantly, um, people have snapped a lot of goofy pictures, um, sometimes of themselves, sometimes of them, their friends. Um, part of, of maker activities is just learning the technology by playing with it. Uh, if the application doesn't seem applicable at first, um, I think we'd all be surprised at, at how that leads in to better use of the technology later. Um, what's in the works for us? Uh, activity cards with rewards. That's something we're kind of stealing from uh, Denver Public Library. Um, in other words, we'll have activity cards uh, where people can do a certain uh, digital maker activity, and they'll receive a reward for completing that. Um, helping partners more. I mentioned that we infiltrated uh, community organizations, and we want to do that more. We want to figure out how we can be a part of the community and help people where they're at. Um, infiltra infiltrating more school events. Um, my particular town's culture, which is uh, uh, pretty common of small town culture, is that sports are really popular and 4-H is really popular. We want to figure out how we can help people, whether it's through uh, video or, or audio recordings, whatever, just help people um, record those events. Um, and programming tutorials for kids. Uh, what we'll be doing for the summer reading program and, and the STEM activities in particular are, are teaching some low-level programming skills uh, for, for very young kids with, with programs uh, like Scratch, Hopscotch, and Daisy the Dinosaur. And uh, along the way, we've learned some things during, uh, as we've implemented uh, everything we've done with our, our creation station slash media lab. Um, the first one is freedom. Te technology needs to be free. Uh, you, you need to open it up to people, in other words. Um, in our, having organized activities is great, and I highly recommend that. But there needs to be room and encouragement for people to play with it and for people to check out the materials. However, it should be known that technology intimidates. In particular, one of the obstacles we've dealt with is the fact that a lot of people are very timid about touching these materials and, and bringing them out of the li library, especially with our, our equipment waivers and all that. That's a piece we're still working on. We're, we're trying to work individuals into uh, being uh, into using the equipment more. Um, the fourth thing is to adapt to culture. Our small town culture is unique. I came from a suburban library where if you build it, they will come. You put these materials out, and people will start playing with them. As long as you have adequate market marketing, we had to go back to the drawing board and figure out how we could meet our community's needs through groups and, and infiltrate infiltrate the communities. Um, the fourth thing is probably something maybe you've all learned about library services in general. Staff sells the service. So uh, if you have an opportunity in your conversations with patrons to tell them about different materials uh, that you have, then um, coaching, coaching staff um, or, and, and learning 
to do it yourself. It's, it's, it's really a skill you need to be able to push those services. And uh, that's pretty much all I have. Great, Tim. That's uh, such a wonderful story also from a very different type of library in a very different situation. And uh, I want to thank you also for sharing that. And um, maybe we'll just start off our um, Q&A with a question that was I think directed mostly at you. You had talked about the genealogy uh, research or ge I'm sorry, genealogy um, uh, oral, oral histories and the types of uses uh, for your media lab and your makerspace in that regard. Could you tell us a little bit about the equipment you used in making the oral histories? Sure. Um, there's, there's some options here. Um, we, we did use our MacBook as well as a, uh, um, a microphone with the M audio device, which I had described. Um, to make it simpler, uh, you can buy uh, what they call a snowball that connects uh, directly via USB. And the reason to do that would just be to get better quality. Uh, from there, uh, you can use GarageBand, which comes standard with, with Mac products. Uh, I prefer that one. The audio quality is much better. Um, but I have used uh, Audacity before, which, which is a free open source program. That one's recommended for podcasts, so that, I, that one is certainly viable. Um, so three pieces of equipment, um, uh, the microphone, the computer, and then just your, your chosen software is what we used. Great. Great. And then um, I have now a, a question actually for uh, Mary. Um, and uh, earlier on people were asking, how do you share the space? And Tim, you might also have something to chime in, but let's have Mary answer it first. Uh, there's uh, you know, one space that you use for all of the equipment. Um, how do you allow people to use it? Um, do they sign up for time slots um, when, it's, when it's out there? How do people have access to it? And when do they, how do they know when it will be available to them? Um, well, we have a master programming calendar where we keep track of all of our, our programs. So um, you know, I know if there's another program scheduled in the room or not. Um, we've been having some open lab times where I just kind of set up the computers and, and pull out some of the other equipment. Um, you know, so people can come in. Right now a lot of the interest has just been the 3D printer. Um, people want to see how that works and stuff like that. Um, but I'm also working on, you know, like I have somebody who called me up to ask about the 3D printer and I scheduled a time to work with her. Um, because it's on a cart that I can, that's on wheels, I can just um, bring it upstairs and um, you know, work with her someplace not in the room so that we don't always have to have access to the room. Um, and that, that's been the nice part about how it was planned is, is everything is really just portable. Um, planning on making other equipment available like the, the craft cutters are, are small, so there's no reason why we can't have time available when people can drop in to use that. Um, when I've had the um, comic artist here, to plan his program, I'm just able to wheel the computer up into my office and he just sat in my office and, and, and worked um, so that he could prepare his program. Um, so it, it's, some things are still a work, on, work in progress, but um, yeah, we do have a master plan for the room um, you know, so, so that we don't schedule. And I kind of have penciled times in because I'm not sure about some future programs, but I don't want the book room to get booked up because um, our room sometimes is, has three different programs happening in the course of a day. So um, we, run a, we run a lot of programs. So that is um, having a one central calendar is really essential. Great. And uh, yeah, it sounds like there's a bit of a juggling act there. Now since you, you mentioned the 3D printers again, we did have uh, one person ask, and, and of course this is a still fairly new technology. Can you just briefly tell us what is a 3D printer? Sure. Um, there was a picture in, in one of my slides of it. Um, and it's just a, it's, I mean it doesn't look like your inkjet printer or anything like that. It's kind of like a box and it has a platform inside of it. And um, on the back is a spool of plastic, and it heats up and then just builds your object in, in layers, and it builds an actual object instead of like printing on a piece of paper. These, these kids up in the upper right-hand corner, the um, printer is in front of them. There's a, if I can slide through. This, um, the, 
the tall picture in the in the corner on the right, um, that's our our Ma our MakerBot. Great. Yes, that's yeah. It. I think that uh, you know maybe satisfies people's curiosity as far as that goes. And uh, I I want to show one more slide, which is that somebody had asked if we display the the slide about why. And this might be a good note to leave things on. Um, why have a makerspace? Um, and so let me just pull that slide up now so you can see it again. There are, of course, many more reasons than what you see on this slide, but these are just a few of them. And of course, there are many questions that you're asking as you evaluate how can you, um, you know, how could you apply these um, ideas to the work in your library. And so for those of you who have been sending in questions that we have not had time to answer, we will follow up. Mary and Tim have both agreed to help us answer some of those questions. So we'll follow up with those questions and get them out to you. Um, but at, at this point, uh, in order to keep us all on schedule, we're going to move towards the end of the, uh, end of the webinar. I, I want to mention that we do have um, additional resources that we'll be sending out. Now you see a few of them here, but don't worry. This slide is not going to stay up long. We'll send this out to you, and you'll have access to all of these resources plus more that we couldn't even fit on this slide. Um, so you'll, you'll get that before the end of the week. Um, and I, I guess, uh, is there any last word, uh, Mary or Tim, that you want to add uh, as far as advice to uh, libraries that are considering uh, uh, trying something in the Makerspace and Media Lab realm? Um, just, just you know, just get out there and and try it. Start small, and um, you know, like Maker Camp. I was sitting in my office every week, like building things out of cardboard and adding LED lights to it. And um, you know, it's really just you just kind of have to, I don't know, be a kid again and just dive in there and not be afraid that you're going to break something or something's not going to work. You know, like. The thing I love about these kind of programs is I don't have to go in with like a lesson plan because really the point is to, you know, let's see where it goes and let the kids kind of, or let the people in the program kind of guide where your program goes. And um, you really can't, I mean, you can't go wrong. Great. Tim, anything to add briefly? I uh, definitely wanted to, to echo uh, Mary's thoughts in terms of playing. You have to, you have to be willing to uh, get your hands dirty, get in there and, and play with the equipment yourself, and to also uh, encourage staff to do that, to be familiar with the technology uh, so that they can show people um, whether it's in a formalized program or not. And uh, you know, kind of jumping off that, you have to shoot from the hip, I think. You have to, you have to go for it. Have a plan, yes, but uh, maker activities are becoming more and and more important uh, to to patrons, um, and and I guarantee it's going to help your small community. Great, thank you. And so with that, um, some great uh, words to leave us at the end of this webinar on digital media labs and maker spaces. We want to say thank you to our sponsor, ReadyTalk, um, for providing us the software for this. Also thank you to the presenters for sharing uh, their expertise, and thank you for attending taking an hour out of your day. Um, please stay on the line for just a minute. As we close the webinar, you'll actually receive a, a, soft, a, a survey that will pop up, and we ask you to fill that out and tell us what you thought of the webinar. And like I said, you'll also receive an email with the archive resources as well. Uh, stay tuned also in your email for a, a TechSoup survey about uh, technology purchasing in your library um, that you'll be receiving a link to at some point soon. So um, uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you who shared. Uh, we'll get back to you with those questions. And please do have a, a wonderful day. Bye-bye.